Anjani, Lead Content Director for Drug Discovery Chemistry. This brief video shows some of our live panel Q&As from our 2020 event, starting with a clip from Phil Baran, our plenary keynote. The video shows how even in a virtual format, the great content and speaker lineup you're used to from our in-person events is still possible. The video also gives a sense of the speaker interactions and engagement online. So I hope you can join us for our next event, May 18th to the 20th, 2021. A question from uh, Benji Hoining, who says, great oh, talk, hey, though, really boring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is asking uh, about that last transformation, uh, coupling carbonyls to olefins, and wondering what's next for that. Can you use amines uh, in place of, of, of ketones or electron deficient heterocycles instead of olefins as acceptors? Uh, yeah, thanks, Benji. That's a great question. And it's definitely on the to do list. Right now, we're just finishing up that paper. We're working with the NSF Center to nail down specifically the mechanistic feature that we think is operative that is a ketyl radical. Um, so we're just writing the support information. You know how, how it goes. We're finishing up this paper. And then the next thing, yeah, we, the, we didn't think of the electron deficient header aromatics. That's a great idea. Um, but, you know, elm and imines come to mind. Um, so we definitely wanted to, to look at those. We have, although we haven't tried it yet, I suspect if there is going to be a challenge for us, it will be in the rate of addition of those types of imino radicals to an olefin versus the rate of their reduction or mm -hmm. dimerization. We were able to overcome that with the case of the ketones. Um, that that was fine, but I don't know what will happen when we were dealing with the naming. So we just have to try it. And especially, I, I really like the idea of the, you know, taking puridines or purizoles, things like that, and seeing if you can make those radicals add them to an olefin and then maybe even reoxidize to give you back the the aromatic heterocycle. So yeah, I'll pass it on to the team. Thanks, Benji. Cool. We got a, a question about electrochemistry from Michael Frong, uh, mentioning that it's normally been applied to redox transformations, but we've got this nice method for the grignard Um do, do, do you envision further advances in, in, in CC bond forming areas with electrochemistry? Yeah, I mean, you know, electrochemistry, like photochemistry, is 100 years old, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of... Uh, just you know reinvestigating something which is interesting and the hope you know starting so i don't know seven years ago when we got into this was that really stemming from a total synthesis effort was that you know maybe this kind of strange method that most people know about but they just think is sort of uh, bizarre and relegated to the energy conversion field or battery chemistry could be somewhat useful to medicinal chemists so we're <clears throat> we're really just focused on uh N the opposite of, of what a normal academic is, which is making a paper. Like, I'm really anti-paper. Like it's <laughs> because, you know, I don't know, there's a famous med chemist who said, you know, you can't prescribe nature papers to cancer patients, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're, the papers are worthless. So we're just interested in, in doing something useful. And um, so, yeah, CC bond formation would be great, but only if, in the context of electrochemistry, only if, there's a value add for either the process or medicinal chemistry community. We, we're really anti-gimmick. So if it's just a gimmick and I can think of 10 other ways of doing this and no one's gonna care, we're not gonna pursue it. So yes, the answer is yes, Mike. It's a great question, Mike. And we, we, but we only wanna pursue those examples where there's a value add proposition where you look and you say, okay, well, I guess I have to break out the potential step because my only other option is 10 steps or right. you know, using some you know, thallium salt or some crazy chemical reagent. Um, so that that's the answer is yes, and the, and the focus is really only on how do we do something useful. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Mary. I've been at Bristol Myers Squibb for about six years, and my expertise is in biophysics, particularly fragment screening, as one of my passions. So I'm really happy to be leading this session. With us, we have Beatrice. You may have heard her talk. She's at Monash University, about to finish her PhD. Uh, she spoke really well on the refill process. We've got some. Great questions already lined up for her. We have Amit, who's coming from Nanotemper. He spoke about the Dianthus technology, a really, really interesting technology for us to consider in fragment space. Will Pomerantz, he spoke yesterday afternoon on a, a Prof NMR, Florian NMR, as it relates to fragment drug discovery. And then Jenny this morning, she spoke on kinase drug discovery, lipid kinases and how they generated a number of, I think even six different series of fragment leads that they could compare the different properties towards finding what they really wanted in their lead molecule. So with that, I'm going to look to the chat for questions. 
But until then, just to sort of kick it off, we have uh, you know some, some starter questions. One for Will, what would you say the size limitation is for your fluorine NMR technique or your labeling the protein? Yeah, this is this is a great question. Um, you know, there. So it's a multi-part answer, I guess. That these have been proteins have been studied when they've been fluorine labeled by a couple dip, couple dip, couple a uh, couple different ways. Uh, people have studied GPCRs um, using fluorine labeling, uh, but that ends up being through through cysteine labeling. There's some nice work by, by Scott Prosser uh, as an example, uh, and using trifluoromethyl groups, which help reduce the CSA problem, which is the big problem of, of fluorine NMR leading to, to broad resonances. We've worked with small proteins, but people have used uh, prof NMR on single labeled aromatic amino acids to 50 to 60 kilodaltons. Um, and then now up to 180 kilo, kilodaltons, uh, Hari Arthanari has a nice Nature Methods paper using Trozy uh, for fluorine NMR, um, particularly with fluorinated tyrosines. And so I recommend checking that out. But a whole size range uh, people have studied, but you do have to worry about the CSA properties uh, that leads to the broad resonances. Really great, thank you. We actually have questions coming in already from the chat. So I'm gonna spare mine for later and go right to Dan Erlinson. He's asking this of Beatrice. Be prepared. <laughs> he first thanks you for staying up so late, realizing the, the great difference in time zone for you. Have you considered using poised fragments for refill to facilitate chemistry? Um, so poised fragments, meaning fragments that are already uh, like uh, that have a, a reactive group attached to them. Is that what is that what that means? We shall see if he replies to that. I'm thinking potentially that's the case or um, molecules that have trajectories where there are easy chemistries, right? So he says uh, yeah. having a synthetic handle. Yeah, um, that's not, it's, I, th I think we, we may already, um, I think we do, we do that in a sense already um, in, in terms of synthesizing the, uh, the, the fragments that we validated from the primary screens um, and we attach a, a reactive handle to them at the, uh, the vector that we're interested in exploring. Uh, perhaps like he meant uh, moving that more upstream like with the, the primary fragment hits. Um, and I think, although it's not something that we have uh, like actively considered, I think there's already fragment uh, fragments within our MFP library that that are like that, um, we we could do with maybe like in you know going over the library and maybe increasing the number of those though. So um, like, sorry, that's a bit of a roundabout way of answering the question. <laughs> he says thank you. <laughs> the next one's coming for Amit. Could you say more about the setup of fragment screening that you presented? For example, concentrations of fragments, um, percentages of DMSO. Sure. Um, thanks, Jan, for this uh, for this question. Now, um, when it comes to DMSO concentrations and fragment concentrations, it usually strongly depends on the stock solutions that we have for a fragment screen. Um, most often we receive fragment uh, or compound solutions at 10 millimolar and DMSO, and then we do a 50 fold dilution into assay buffer, meaning 2% final DMSO and a 500 micromolar fragment concentration. Um, that being said, um, if we have a higher fragments, a high, more highly concentrated fragment stock, or if we want to screen at a higher concentration, I think in the Sting case, we even screened at one millimolar. Um, it depends mostly on the target protein. So there are some proteins that generally well tolerate 5% DMSO, uh, but as you might know, some target proteins are really, let's say, uh, picky when it comes to these uh, assay buffer conditions, and uh, you will have to decrease the DMSO concentration. Um, yeah, so as I said, it depends a bit on the target. Uh, we test usually for target stability in the final assay buffer at different DMSO concentrations over longer times. 
Um, so saying like five to 10 hours, uh, depending on how long the liquid handling takes. And, uh, and then as soon as we know the, fra uh, the protein is stable, let's say at 5% uh, DMSO, we can also screen higher fragment concentrations. Uh, the question is, as you know, the, the protein modification yeast of both memory cells are very different. Mm -hmm. And so if you express human protein into the yeast, and you're looking for protein-protein interaction, the confirmation modification are very, very crucial to the kind of right confirmation, right modification. The question for you is, how do you know the protein you express in the yeast are functional? equivalent like memory cell? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's something that uh, we, we spent a long time optimizing. It depends on the constructs that you have. So for example, for a KRS program, it has to be nuclear for us to see the signal. So we have to chop off any membrane associated in the main. Uh, if, in terms of PTMs, if there's anything that's required for the PPI, we won't get an interaction until we fix that. So if, it means co-expression of a chaperone or a cofactor uh, to get those modifications in place, we could do that. Our ultimate, our initial readout is the reconstitution of the interaction and making sure that the interaction is happening with the same affinity that would, it would in the mammalian system. Uh, so we can gauge based on the cell viability readouts that we put in the rough affinity. So we can tell if something is like a 10 nanomolar binder versus a 500 nanomolar. So we try to get it as close as possible to the physiological interaction, KD. Uh, and that's reassuring to us that we're, we're constituting something that's in the native state. Uh, and then from there we start without premise for the disruption assays that we do. Um, I'll uh, start with a few questions from uh, Morali's talk. So um, obviously, uh, Roar Gamete has been a, a hot topic, both preclinical and clinical for uh, some periods of time. Um, you know, you characterized your molecule as a uh, inverse agonist, but I was wondering if you had any data versus an antagonist, if you had co-repressor data, um, as well to know whether you get co-recruitment or not? Um, we haven't specifically looked at co-recruitment, but we did look at, we also worked on the agonist as well. Uh, so clearly, uh, even with the same chemotype, we were able to get uh, both agonist as well as inverse agonist. Mm -hmm. uh, since there is already a fairly decent levels of uh, constitutive activity, uh, we can see very nice uh, inhibition, the inverse agonism that we see with our compound. Um, we had both classes of compound, obviously, for inflammation in the uh, mm -hmm. Great interest. That's where we focused on. Obviously, it used to be very hard target. And uh, with number of companies failing, we said, OK, we will uh, continue to work on and try to get the right uh, properties in the molecule to move it forward. So that's where we are now in phase two. Yeah, I was wondering if you could share anything about how you improved solubility um, and the properties. That's a longstanding problem in the Rorg MIT, you know, um, area, you know, and whether you were using specific interactions from the crystal structure or carboxylic acids, or it was uh, just addition of, of polarity? I think it's mostly addition of polarity. Uh, as you know, that uh, uh, you need uh, at least one of the end of the molecule fairly lipophilic, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the middle portion where we could get, uh, bring in some polarity and improve the solubility. Uh, as you saw in the presentation, we have about 30 micromolar, fairly decent solubility. But it took quite a while to get that kind of solubility. But I think once we got the solubility, a lot of issues with some of the off-target effect that was uh, consistently there in our initial set of compounds went away. So mm -hmm. that was a big break, I think, once we improved the solubility, we could get much more selective molecule. Yeah. Okay. And maybe just one additional question. Um, what was? Do you have the protein binding for? Oh yeah, we do. We do have uh, compared to some of the early first generation compounds, I think in human, we have about 5% uh, free fraction. Okay. So okay. I think most of the early generation compounds, I think are extremely mm -hmm. high in binding. I think they were 99 plus, but we have about 5% free fraction in uh, human. So pretty decent free fraction. Mm -hmm. A live question from the chat for Ra. I was wondering if you could comment on why you saw 100% Dmax of FAK in vitro, but only 75% it's a really good question. Um, it's not something we're hugely sure of ourselves. Um, I think there are questions around that we're using the same antibody, but you're going from 
cell lysates to whole liver homogenates. So I think there's questions around antibody specificity in there. Um, also questions around whether that FAK is in different cellular localizations, if it's bound to different complex partners, which prevents its degradation is a possibility. But um, I think that's, that's something which we'd really like to get to the bottom of, but we don't have a firm handle on as yet. So good question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to address another question that came up during my talk, which was, does the protein need to be naturally degraded using the proteasome in order to target it using a protein? Or will degradation using protein work on any target protein, even if degraded using other physiological systems? So I, my interpretation of this is the question pertains whether if the target is typically, for example, degraded by a lysosomal process, could you still target it using a protein? Um, I don't think we have hard data on it, but my general understanding of the system is that if you're able to put a ubiquitin on a, on a target um, and drive recruitment to the proteasome, you're most likely able to degrade it using the ubiquitin proteasome system. There's, at least in my understanding, no fundamental barrier to that. That being said, there will be proteins out there that are not tractable for proteasomal degradation. And I think there could be various mechanisms to that. It could be compensatory but mechanisms that could be associated with depths that just counteract any, any ubiquitination of the target. Um, but I don't think that's gonna be a divide that's defined by whether under regular physio physiological conditions, the protein is sent to the lysosome or is sent to the proteasome. It's more gonna be on, if a target protein, for example, is so essential to the cell, it keeps a very controlled number of copies. It might have very strong counteracting forces that would be hard to overcome. 